on history so it doesn't repeat. We discuss the past, present, and future of public schooling with Charlotte Iserby, former senior policy advisor for the U.S. Department of Education. We'll discover the root cause of the deliberate dumbing down of Americans. Learning's the answer. What's the question? It's all coming up next on History, so it doesn't repeat. Good evening and welcome back to History So It Doesn't Repeat. I'm your host and navigator, Richard Grove, and this episode is composed to provide you with an explicit understanding of how and why America is being deliberately dumbed down and what we can do about it one mind at a time. Tonight's guest is Charlotte Thompson Iserby, who served as a senior policy advisor in the Office of Educational Research and Improvement of the United States Department of Education during the first Reagan administration. There, Charlotte witnessed a horrifying landscape of public schooling. Specifically, it's focused to change the attitudes, values, beliefs, and reactions of students, noting that the school system was not about education of individuals, but rather a system of brainwashing individuals away from self-reliance. That is where she first blew the whistle on a major technology initiative which would control the curriculum in America's classrooms. She's here tonight to share her lifetime of experience concentrating on some very substantial and meaningful points of focus. Charlie, if you'd like to start off by, uh, you know, just letting the audience know why you do what you do. There are a lot of people who ask me that, including my own family, members of my own family. I think that uh, many of us researchers out there who have been doing this for at least uh, 50, 60 years, some of us, uh, I started in the mid-70s, early 70s, but there's some that are absolutely brilliant, still working, who were involved in the 60s in it. And, you know, once you, once you find it out, Richard, that they really have, their, their motives are really evil. When, when they show you in their own research, when you find these things out, there's nothing you can do except to keep moving because you, we're human beings. And we have a soul, and we have character, and we have a mind, fine minds. And we're, we we're made to do something with our lives. We're not made to be controlled. And uh, I, I could just mention one document that has bothered me for many years. I, I found it, actually, in, in the early 70s. And it was before I knew anything about B.F. Skinner or Pavlov, or William Spady, or any of these people, or outcomes-based education. And it was a, a grant that was given by the U.S. Office of Ed in 1968 to the Chicago, uh, an inner city school in Chicago. And uh, Professor Benjamin Bloom, his, his wife, Sophie, was involved in it, and uh, by the way, he's very important in all of our research uh, because he is the leading behavioral psychologist. He's, he died about 10 years ago, but uh, all of the outcomes-based ed materials and mastery learning and the Skinner method, uh, really Bloom pretty much put it all together. And uh, his quote is enough to upset anybody who knows anything about what's going on in schools. He said, the purpose of education is uh, to change the thoughts, actions, and feelings of students and define good teaching as challenging the students' fixed beliefs. Now, that is the number one guy uh, that all teachers have to go through Bloom's, Bloom's uh, taxonomy, uh, values, and cognitive uh, area. So uh, this particular grant to the Chicago Inner City School called for, I have it, it's on my son's website. And I didn't know at the time I got a hold of it just how important it was going to be because it's going in right now. The final uh, nail is in the coffin. It's going in under Common Core. It's going in uh, getting rid of uh, grades, no more K through 12, no more competition. You can graduate at 14 or 21. Uh, and Pavlov, hmm? Skinner. Going in right now. 
That's the plan. That's the Soviet system, actually. But when I looked at this being used on the inner city kids, which actually, after 12 years of it, Education Week, the premier journal on education, referred to it as a human tragedy of enormous proportions. All, half of the inner city kids dropped out. Where are they now? But I didn't know when I saw it. I, I didn't realize that this was going to be the result. But this one piece of paper, it had three columns. And one said input. And then it had the middle column was curriculum. And then the third column was output. And it had, and then you had one, two, three going down the page. Students, then teachers, and then Richard, you asked me why I got going, community. I knew then this is lifelong. So they take the students, the poor teachers who've been suffering for many, many years with all this in-service training, trying to, you know, absolutely destroy their minds and their values and the community and you give them the curriculum so-called the resources and then they come out in the third column each one of them says desired characteristics now as i say if that's if everybody had to say goodbye richard uh you know i've heard enough today i think i understand i would say yes you do that is the purpose of American education. It has nothing to do with academics. So I saw that, and I fall, started following it. And I, I went to some in-service training when William Spadey was there, and I, I wrote up the stuff. And, of course, let me point out that before going into the Department of Ed, I was a local school board member, too. And I'd gone up against all these people. I understood what change agents were in the 70s. Uh, I didn't know when I came back from uh, overseas in 1971 and I decided to run for school board. I had no idea what I was going to run into. But I was shocked, you know, when we were meant to be putting together a philosophy for the schools. Our major change agent out of Harvard, uh, superintendent, asked all of us, said, now, what do you think the schools should do? And, I, and so we all had to write down, we thought, I said, well, I thought that they should teach strong academics and help these students have strong morals and values. And, and everybody jumped on me. Not everybody, half the people on this little council said, whose? Whose values? Huh? And I thought, I've been out of the country 20 years. I didn't know that we had changed. And I began to question that, and I questioned a lot on the board, and I was very unpopular because Camden, Maine, is probably one of the most liberal, beautiful, of course, the liberals always love beautiful towns on the water, uh, in the country. I think we were a pilot for change, definitely. We were. And I saw it. And then a teacher, the reason I'm talking about this is that when I got into the department, when I actually, before I got in the department, I found that Chicago, that Chicago plan. But... While I was on the board, a teacher called me, a master teacher, and she said, I agree with, you know, everything you're doing. Good for you. Uh, I was really taking bricks. I mean, everybody's throwing everything they could at me. The media hated me. Every week I'd have a pic bad picture on the, in the paper. Uh, she hates children, all this stuff, because I was voting against values clarification, decision making, all this stuff. And she said, you're right on. She said, I want you to go for training. I'll pay. And I said, what, what is it? And she said, well, it's called Innovations in Education. And I said, oh, yeah, well, I guess that's what I'm looking at here on the board. And she said, it sure is, but I want you to understand what it's all about and where it's coming from. So I went, and she paid $100 for me to go. And I was, we, we got a big book, this big, huge, about 200 pages. It was called uh, Innovations in Education, A Change Agent's Guide by Ronald Havelock out of the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, which subsequently, when I got into the Department of Ed in 1981, we were still funding it, my office. And, you know, so um, I went, and they had this facilitator there, and he trained us, a lot of nice teachers from my own school district and everything, and all good people, in how to identify the resistors in our community. And you ask me what got me going to, that was it. 
because I've been in communist countries. I have been uh, had conversations in third class on a freighter coming back from the Far East with people who are getting out. You know, one lovely woman, she was Chinese, taking her daughter to Paris to study piano. And she uh, she told me about her grandfather during the Cultural Revolution, had his hands cut off, pianos. And then uh, the woman with her grandfather was the head of a town in North Vietnam. And he opposed the regime and they killed him and they took his head and marched it around town on a pole. You know, so... Charlotte was, I was learning, I, all these years, these, this was before I came back to the United States. So I knew a little bit about the fact that communism was something we had to be very concerned about, no matter whether they tell you it's dead or not. It's not. It will never be dead. It will be alive long after I'm dead and long after you're dead and long after every single grandchild of the audience out there is dead. And it's very, very dangerous. And I've stuck with this. And people can call it, they want to call it corporate fascism or socialism, or uh, they can call it communitarianism or communism, whatever, but they're all isms. And we're not an ism form of government. And I personally think it's communism because that is the education system being put in right now. It's clearly, you can check off every single thing for school to work, planned economy. That's what's going in. You know, so I went through that and to be, to be, Taught how to identify yourself is sort of an interesting experience. Uh, I thought, ooh, these people mean business. They little do they know I'm here in the, you know, I'm here to be trained to identify myself. Huh? So you ask me, when this these things start coming up, you know, in, at your local school board meeting or in your community. Uh, and they start, you know, taking elected officials away and merging towns with towns and dropping borders. I knew, because I'd been all over the world, I knew that this was communism. This is regionalism, and regionalism is communism. And I have all the documents on that, right? And so I'm happy I did get a hold of that article in the Communist Daily World, where a communist admits it. You know, in 1976, he said, we're moving too slowly on regionalism, uh, it worked so well in the Soviet Union. So that's what we're looking at, folks. And and how can anyone, anyone, turn their back on episodes like this unless they're part of the program? I mean, anybody. I, I always say divide and conquer. They want all of us, the left and, you know, the, of course, the left and the right at the top are the same. Absolutely. Their agenda is the same. But, you know, you have Democrats and you have Republicans and they're good people and they're going about their lives and, and they truly do believe in a lot of things that I don't agree with. But uh, we should not let that affect our, our relationships with these people because we're all Americans and we all have, you know, the Constitution and Bill of Rights were not written for just certain people. They were written for all Americans. I don't care whether they're black or white or green or, or, or handicapped or not handicapped or brilliant or rich or poor or what? Fat, thin? No. We've got to be very careful that we do not allow ourselves to be, you know, splintered and divided up because that is the, the goal of those in power. I, I always call them the people on the 135th floor of Rockefeller Center. What do they talk about when they meet once a month? You know, they say, oh, well, they haven't yet figured it out. You know, figured what out? They haven't yet figured it out that the left and the right at the top are the same. They haven't yet figured it out yet that we're going to keep them all divided on issues like abortion and euthanasia and everything else. And But have you ever noticed the sacred cow? There's a sacred cow there, and that's education. You don't hear much about education. You might hear about Common Core, but we've had that for many, many years. It's just a Marxist curriculum. Now it's very, you know, it's going to be able to be implemented without a hitch because of computers and assessment. But there's, that's not the key issue. Uh, I've, I, we've all been fighting the national assessment ever since 1970. That's, that's the Carnegie Corporation which in 1934 said in the little blue book that we have said, uh, we'll, we'll use the schools to change America uh, to a planned economy. 
And so that's exactly what, if you follow Carnegie all the way through with all of its funding of the Education Commission of the States, the National Assessment, the National Governors Association, the school to work agenda, the agreements with the Soviet Union uh, to develop uh, computer courseware and critical thinking for early elementary school children, Carnegie, 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 you know, so... That's where we are right now. And so people who fuss about Common Core, and good, I don't blame them. Some of them are 20, 30 years old, a lot younger than I am. They don't know the history that we have. They don't understand anything about the fact that these decisions were made in the late 1800s. The method was brought over from Germany, from Leipzig, in, in the late 1800s by G. Stanley Hall, the Skinner Pavlovian method. This was before the revolution, the Soviet revolution, the Bolshevik revolution. Uh, they don't understand that the order at Yale, I do believe, uh, and uh, I, I, it's weird that I happen to be connected with it. Weird's hardly the word. But yeah, I, I, I think that they probably are in charge of education. Uh, the order at Yale, if you have to pinpoint, because they brought the method in. And they also were involved in the early 60s. Now, it's not that I'm not opposed to integration by any means, but they needed integration in order to experiment on the minorities. And so you have the method coming in under with G. G Stanley Hall, who was uh, over studying in Leipzig, and uh, but it was... Uh, Gilman, the head of Hopkins, who brought Stanley Hall in, and then Dewey and all of them were trained in the Pavlov method, right? And they knew what they were doing. That was even prior to 1934 when Carnegie decided to change our economic system to a planned economy through the schools. This was all being planned. You know, Rockefeller was involved too, and Carnegie was involved too. But, uh, when you, if you know the history, well, we've all said this, you know, that's why they don't teach history. I mean, if the American people knew the history behind the deliberate dumbing down of America and the destruction of their children's morals and values, they wouldn't say that, oh, Charlotte, you're a conspiracy person. Well, it is really quite an incredible conspiracy, I believe, that they managed to pull it off uh, with people. I mean, I think it's great those guys up on the 34th floor. Congratulations. They've really done a good job. I mean, uh, they must have read Bernays' propaganda over and over and over again. And they've read Tragedy and Hope over and over again. And they've even read, I guess, uh, Tony Sutton's books over and over and over again about the order. And... Uh, so they're looking at all of us and saying, well, you know, we made it through another month. You know, we, we, we still got them on the conspiracy thing. And uh, they've got everybody divided. And if, you, if anybody has the truth, uh, they're conspiracy freak. I mean, I'm sure you've had that, too. I, when I, I, used to be, uh, I used to be called a kook when I was on the local school board. The minute I identified what was really going on with my Marxist change agent, who actually he liked me a lot because he knew I knew what he was doing, and he was a rather nice person, but he used to lie about me all the time, and even though he admitted to people that he liked me better than anybody else in the town, uh, and because we, we, just, we just managed to get along. But uh, I went after an interesting little thing in a global education textbook in 1973 where they had the teachers taking first graders through town and having them identify big houses and little houses and then the teacher would say who do you think lives in the big house the big captain's house with a cupola beautiful and then in Maine we have zoning who lives in the house across the street the mobile home oh they must be poor people well what do you think they eat in the captain's house steak what do you think they eat in the, in the mobile home? Pizza. And I thought, oh, then I've been around. The, I knew. I said, this is class warfare. They're starting it in first grade. So, hey, Common Core people out there, realize 
This has been with us a long, long time. And if we've got problems with Americans now who don't understand, it's because it has been so intensive and some multi-millions of dollars have gone into this kind of Marxist education. And so I went to the school board and I was very sort of naive. You know, I said, I don't understand this in this new global education textbook. Uh, it, what is this? I said, I don't like it. Oh, next day the word was out. I was a kook all over town. So that went on and on. Then I got into the department and you asked me uh, why, you know, I like peanuts. You can not, not many, a lot of people can't eat them anymore, but I like peanuts, any nuts, you know. It's like peanuts. You start getting into their own words. You know, like Benjamin Bloom. The perp that's enough, isn't it, for people? They don't, I have a million quotes. I like one of the best ones is the, the computer guy, Dustin Houston. This is for parents. He's the head of the World Institute for Computer Assisted Teaching. Now, everything's on computers now, Mom and Dad. No more books. They're taking all the books out. All the charter schools are going in. Get rid of the books, putting the computers in. And uh, But Dustin Houston, he said this quite a while ago, about 25 years ago. I guess he's sorry he said it. He said, won't it be wonderful when the child in the most remote area of the world or the country can have the benefit of the world's finest psychologists on the computer and nobody can get between that child and the curriculum? Now, all right, Common Core that's bad news. That's what you're going to get with Common Core. And it's all Marxist curriculum, all comes out of UNESCO. Uh, if you go to Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian educator, uh, communist, who wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he has, his, he has a perfect right to do this, but I don't know why we have to adopt it. Uh, but this is the kind of thing Common Core is putting in. Uh, you teach arithmetic to first graders, you have them counting little grenades. But that's not new because back in the 70s, the Carnegie Corporation funded a reading program for the inner city kids, again, inner city kids, and it was called Torch the Porch. Yes, and they were, this was reading, you know, torch, and they have a picture of the torch and the porch, and they have to fill in the, the blanks. Torch the porch. Now, isn't that common core? So we've had it for years, and those of us who've been fighting it, and I don't know how anybody, once they know what I'm talking about today, uh, cannot fight it. It's just in your, in your genes that when you see something like this that is so wrong, you know, even if you don't have children, and a lot of our researchers don't, <laughs> they're great. And, and they've, they've become, you know, day in and day out, they've done research, They've been speaking and writing, and of course, always boycotted. You know, I mean, Richard, everything I ever wrote was boycotted, not by the left, by the Trotskyite conservatives. Right from the beginning, everything I've written, Soviets in the Classroom, uh, you know, America's Latest Education Fad, which dealt with Ronald Reagan signing the agreements with Gorbachev in 1985 to merge the two systems. It's a little flyer. Boycotted, boycotted, until finally a really good guy who was one of them at one time in Washington, a, a true conservative, got a hold of it. He, he was the head of a group in Washington, and he published it five years after the fact because they wouldn't go near it. And then my little book, Back to Basics Reform, which is on my website, free download, and you can also buy it at Amazon now, uh, Back to Basics Reform or Skinnerian International Curriculum, necessary, this is on the front, Necessary for United States participation in a one-world socialist government planned for the early years of the 21st century. I wrote it in 1984, and it had everything in it that is going on right now, all documented from the first development of standards and goals at the Northwest Regional Lab in, the 1970, in 1970, where they said right in there, and that, that's in Back to Basics. People really ought to go get that book. They said right in there that there will be no content because life, things change so fast. And so what do we do? Oh, we just, they say it, we just change values. 
So that is in 1970. That was the first development of real standards for American education out of the Northwest Regional Lab. And so what do the conservatives do? They boycott that little book that warned. Oh, I really warn people about global education. I warn them about the horrible critical thinking, which is Paulo Freire and the Brazilian and Marxist stuff. I, 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 everything was in there, even the Dustin Houston quote, I think. And Ted Bell, all the quotes on effective schools, everything. And people can get it. They can buy it now. We just ran a new run on it. It's been republished at Amazon. Or it's a free download at my website, deliberatedumbingdown.com. So when you see these things, and I probably never would have recognized the role of, of the order if it hadn't been for, uh, in 1984, uh, I was working on uh, Phyllis Schlafly's book, Child Abuse in the Classroom, and helping with that. We, we, that's how we got our regulations to protect the children. We finally did get regulations. And I was talking to Anthony Sutton, I was, I guess I've always been concerned with communism. And uh, he was too, obviously. Look at all the books he wrote about USA to the Soviet Union and, and the Skull and Bones and, and, and everything else. And a mar marvelous man. And so one day, um, I was taking care of my dad at home. He was dying of cancer. And, uh, the, you know, the, he, he did, my father heard all these conversations going on with Phyllis Schlafly poor guy we put a, his bedroom next to the kitchen and the phone was in the kitchen and Phil uh, Sutton called and we were talking about something and he said uh, I can't I can't figure this out Charlotte it, I, I've got mountains and mountains of research and there's just got to be something big behind all of this and I don't know what it is well luckily just that day my father had received these three books, the membership of the order. And he, I was opening all his mail because I was taking care of him. And um, I had never seen these three black books. And they're, they have the dates. It says catalog on it. And it has the dates of the living ones and uh, living and dead and, and another one. What's the third one? I don't know. But anyway... Uh, I, I saw them and I took them into my father and I said, well, I don't know, dad, look at this, all this stuff from the order. And he said, wow. He said, they never did that before. And I didn't pay much attention, but when Sutton said that to me, I said, you know, my dad just received the membership list of the order. And he, I, and he said, what? And I said, yeah. I didn't know that it was something so unusual, really. And he said, could I have, and then, you know, and he said, I promise you, I will get them back overnight. And he did. He went to, uh, you know, Kinko's, and then he called me the next day after he put all the, the, the books, because it's not just their names. You know, each one is given about two inches of text on what they've done, where they came from. Whatever. And so anyway, uh, he, he sent them back to me. And uh, he told me that uh, this was it. He said, this, this is the answer. I finally have got it. And I know exactly what he means. I mean, I'm not involved that much politically with understanding, uh, you know, aid to the Soviet Union. I, I did. I, I've read a lot about this stuff. But he was a real expert. Uh, I was rather expert on education. And... Uh, I do remember my father, who was not important in the order. You know, he was in the order, but his friends were. Some of them were very high up. But uh, dad was a constitutionalist, mayor, mayor of our town, two towns, and he would get very upset if anybody ever pulled regionalism on him or anything like that. But one day he said to me, Char, um, he said, you know, you're a very good writer. But I don't know that I like... I don't know that I like so much what you're writing about. And I thought, you know, I don't, I don't understand what he's talking about. But mom, mom said, we all adored him. He's a wonderful man, a New York lawyer. And, and my mother said, you know, she was from the South, conservative from Virginia, right? She said, you know, your dad, I never know what side of the bed he's going to get out of in the morning, the communist or the conservative. See, that was the order that had done that to him. 
he was really uh, very uh, conflicted. Uh, but when it came to being a wonderful person and a great father and everything, he was fantastic. And at the end, though, when he died, he looked at me and he said uh, he'd heard enough of my talking to Phyllis and Anthony Sutton and all. And he said, Shar, uh, if I had more time, I'd help you. So he evidently, I think he got the message. But so I, I must say, I'm not the great expert on the order. I am, you know, as far as, you know, Chris Milligan, you probably know Chris Milligan. Well, you know, he wrote this, this great book here. I think people can see it, Fleshing Out Skull and Bones. And I did the, a chapter in there for Chris. And it's a very personal chapter. It doesn't have anything to do with politics, really, except it does have a little bit. Well, this one is the one that has... This one here, Anthony's book, Sutton, there's a good little story here. I just had my eyes operated on, so I really can't read very well, but I'm going to read this to you because this fellow, Matheson, E.O. Matheson, Skull and Bones, 1923, my, my dad went to Hotchkiss with him, so they knew each other, and uh he was also a member of the order, Matheson and my dad, right? I want to read this to people because I'm so glad that maybe Chris Milligan made Anthony put this on the book cover. I'm really glad he did because it's easy for me to find. This is for people who may think the order, oh, you know, it's just another little boys club. And, you know, was it George Bush? He, he says, oh, it's so secret. I can't talk about it or whatever. And I carry those two running for, how about, that's a good one too. How do you ever end up with two Guys, Kerry and Bush running for president of the United States when you've got 300 million people and they're both members of the order. Okay, so that's good. But let me read this. This says this quote says, quote, as long as we have somebody from Bones who can bring pressure on the committee, I should think we'll be all right. End quote. And this is my father's friend, E.O. Matheson. Skull and Bones, 23, to Donald Ogden Stewart, Skull and Bones, 1916, a lot older, about Marty's upcoming appearance before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Now, ooh, now, it's funny what happens in life. When I got to Camden, I was taking all these radical stop it, stop it, move stuff, Give us academics. Stop the values destruction. Stop this. Stop that. Stop all death ed, sex ed, all these programs that were designed to do just the opposite, right? And I have the proof on that out of the guidance counselor's journal. They, they actually admitted that all these programs were to do just the opposite. But here, so I'm not very popular in Camden. So it was around Christmas time. I went to this lovely Christmas party. It was snow outside, the moon and all. I went with my husband. His daughter, Matheson's daughter, lived in my town. Yeah. And so we'd sort of gotten to know each other socially because her father and my father were friends. But she did not like me. And so we're all having a lovely time, the Christmas tree, and just so festive, and snowflakes. And she comes up to me. She's had a bit drink. And she said, why do you make so much trouble in this town? And I said, Mary, what do you mean? On the school board, why are you always voting no? Do you really think you know better than the superintendent? And I said, well, yeah, I do. I think I do know, and I know him very well. And he probably knows I know better too. And she kept going after me, and I started to cry. See, it was in public. She was really destroying me. I walked. I got up, I left the party, and this is for people who think we all enjoy this so much. At least eating peanuts is enjoyable, but what we do day in and day out, all across the country, people like myself, going up against it is not much fun. And so I left the party, and I walked back in the snow. It's a funny story how it ends. It has nothing to do with politics. I go in the house, and... Uh, my two sons, like 
14 and 15 are sitting in the kitchen and there's all the smoke. They're smoking cigarettes. Mom's gone. I'll never forget. <laughs> I said, well, you know, only something like that could bring me out of this horrible evening that I've had. You guys now put those cigarettes away and no more of that. Uh, but I remember that so well uh, that she really just couldn't resist going after me. And she was just one person out of many. This went on for 20 years in Camden. That's why I wonder how many people in your audience realize that there have been these Americans out there, better than myself in many cases, and suffering the same way, having the same media blackout, uh, who are responsible for the fact that you and I are able to communicate tonight on Skype and that we still have lots of freedom left. We do. And uh, people, have, they'd love us to think that we're about to go down. I don't go for that stuff of, you know, uh, you know, get out in the streets and, and, and they're going, they're going to bring the, the military in and we we're going to, I just don't go there. Because I think they want us to go there to get us terrified and to turn against each other because one person wants to go there, the other doesn't, and, and keep us all occupied like that while they make this huge effort to conclude their agenda. Now, I, I think that their, their agenda, they never could have done it without education. There's no question about that. And that's why we have this project, which we can talk about later exposing the global road to ruin through education that's at youtube that we have a trailer on that but in putting all of this research together with about 20 of us leading researchers out there in the country some have been around since as i said the 60s rosa corey is on the, one of them and uh we've got four public school educators one principal public school and we, and we have about 250 pages of very, very important written, uh, written submissions from people who are either no longer with us or couldn't join us for the two conferences that were covered. And when, in 1976, they had the uh, Declaration of Interdependence in Philadelphia. And that was this, this in, folks, I just want to point out that what I'm going what I'm saying now relates to the fact that I I think they're behind time. I think they're very much behind time because of people like you, Richard, your audience, all these great Americans that came before the media never gave them any coverage. So you don't know who they were or anything, but they have kept it from happening. And I think that probably the latest that they expected they'd have to wait was 1990 when George senior, you know, uh, the Gulf War, when he said uh, the big speech about the New World Order. I think that was the latest. I know that Henry Steele Commager, who drafted the Declaration of Interdependence, which called for a world government, signed by 126 members of the United States House of Representatives in 1976. And we think the guys are bad now. Huh? 100. I think right at that point, they were probably all Democrats. Now you'd have 100, you know, you could probably double it because you got the Republicans on board. Hmm? But that was a very important uh, milestone right there, which showed they were they were ready to move. And Commager, he, they also put together this curriculum for globalism and uh, the NEA did it. By the way, NEA at the top is in bed with David Rockefeller. I have all those documents from the NEA Cardinal Principles that leads uh, that that state that the NEA, when they did this Cardinal Principle project, in the back they have the pre-planning committee, and at the top they have David Rockefeller and McGeorge Bundy. Now, who would ever dream that the National Education Association, which one thinks of as being a leftist uh, teachers' union that hates kids and all that, and they're not because most of the teachers in the union have to be there. They don't hate kids, and they're not leftists, and they don't know anything about David Rockefeller running the NEA, right? So anyway, that curriculum, it's sort of, I don't know how well they did with it. But we're, then you have, we don't get any media coverage, as I said before. But 
think back just five years to North American Union controversy, remember? Uh, Lou Dobbs, fantastic at CNN. They got rid of him and others. And Americans, they made a big mistake up on the 135th floor there. They thought we were ready for that. And by golly, they found out we were not ready for that. And they made a big mistake because the media, and then everybody, all of us jumped on board. No, we don't want that. We got our, all our newsletters out and all, and it went underground. You don't hear much about it anymore. That doesn't mean they're not busy. But the point I'm trying to make is that they're behind schedule. And I think we've got at least 10 years and maybe 20. But all of that, it, it, well, 20 years could disappear overnight if, like, a constitutional convention is approved. They're waiting for our, the conservatives to, to get us into a constitutional convention. And they probably talk about that up there, too. Gee, they say, well, it's great. We don't have to do it. We just leave it up to the neoconservative Trotskyites. They're going to do it for us. They're going to have something like a parent's right, you know, constitutional convention to, to approve the rights of parents to bring up their children. Oh, everybody sign on, right? Uh-uh, no, do not go there. No constitutional convention. If there's anything that we have to avoid, like the plague, it's the constitutional convention. And they're close to getting it. And I don't know how many votes short. Because if they get that, forget the 20 years we've got. Because then Carnegie will have its way. And as it said, uh, we'll take your land. In the little blue book, it says that Americans are going to get sort of upset, you know, when, they, when their land is taken from them. That's in the book. The words are there. This is the uh, book that talks about using the schools to, to uh, change America. And so what we're, that's why I keep after it. And, and also, you know, you've got to realize that I'm probably a little bit, anybody who does this for so long uh, becomes so accustomed to doing it that I don't know what I'd do if I didn't do it. Although I like to paint. I like, I really keep, everybody keeps saying, they say, Charlotte, you have all these boxes of oil paints and canvases. And when are you going to go back to painting? And, and I think, well, maybe in my next life, I don't know. But um, I am, um, I, I'm just, I hope that what I've said here helps people understand that you have to. It's something in the human nature that God gave us. We know it's right to do it. You know, you have right and wrong. And if you don't do it, it's wrong. Because there are generations in, in our form of government, too, which is so superb. I mean, how many hundreds of thousands of people came to this country to benefit from what they're taking away from us right now? And how many, hundred, how many thousands of servicemen have died on the shores of foreign countries and no-win wars? to protect what you and I and others are fighting to hold on to. And this is something, this, this word has got to get out to Americans that we can't let this system go. The rest of the world is depending on us too, not to let it go. And they don't realize, certainly in education, the rest of the world does not know that the United States basically is responsible for the dumbing down of the whole world. I saw all the, the grants and contracts in my office in the Department of Ed. Awful. Going all over the world to implement OBE, Outcomes Based Ed. Wim Spady ended up in South Africa. John Goodlad was in Thailand in the 60s uh, trying to get the Thais to give up their classical education. So the United States has been deeply involved, and I apologize. You know, to the, in, in the project we did, I apologize. But... We put that behind us and let's now try to save the ship from going down because when we go, the rest of the world goes. And we, we've made it so that they're ready to go anyway because they're, they're get, they have the same curriculum, the same outcomes-based education, the same Marxist curriculum. And most of these countries are socialist anyway. Some are communist. We're the only, uh, I believe, we're probably the only constitutional republic, unless they've got one little one somewhere in Africa or something. Uh, so we have a system that is so beautiful. And uh, the proof of that is the fact that everybody's come over here 
to get away from the one that they're trying to put us under. What are we doing? It just doesn't make sense. I mean, it just doesn't make sense, but doesn't anybody think about it? Or is it that the lack of history? Our, our young people, and not, not so young anymore, they don't really understand that there was another way and that the family came first and that the schools, and I'm a public school supporter, actually, uh, even though I wrote that big book, but I am very much, a, uh, in fact, right now, I think, can't believe what I'm going to say, but I, I actually have had to make a decision and make a recommendation on our, on our project, and I have the other researchers on board with me, which is good, uh, that we are having to come down on the side of public education as bad as it is versus the school choice proposals, because they, not only are they bad, they're lethal, because they will destroy our representative form of government. And people may wonder, what does that have to do with it? It has plenty, because the charter schools do not have elected boards. And uh, the charter schools are the same as public schools, identical. The only difference is they are run by unelected councils. And that is the Soviet system. And if any of these private schools, oh, the Catholic Church right now, it's a disaster. They are accepting the program that I talked about earlier in Chicago that Benjamin Bloom's wife was involved in. And the man who was the major person involved in that, his name was Lee Shulman. Not only after that disaster, what he was, instead of being fired forever, what he did, they promoted him. He went to Stanford to develop the teacher performance based teacher certification. And then when Ernest Boyer at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching died, they made him president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. This is the guy that was responsible for half the inner city kids going down the tubes with Skinner and the, the program that's going in across the country now. No grades, all that I was talking about earlier. Now I wonder, I, f I keep following him, and I didn't know where he was, but I just found out from a great researcher. She's Catholic. She's doing all the research on the Common Core going into the Catholic schools, and she has sent letters out to all the bishops with all her massive brief on Common Core. And so she said... Oh, Charlotte, did you say Lee Shulman was involved in the in the Chicago Mastery Learning Disaster? I said, yes. And she said, oh, he's working with the Catholic hierarchy, uh, the Catholic Education Association. This is how many years later? 50? To put the Common Core in with his little touch. This is the guy responsible for half the inner city kids dropping out in Chicago that is now working with the Catholic Church. So, uh, you know, when you when what goes around comes around. I mean, it just is it's really unbelievable. Uh, if you stay with it long enough, you see all the connections. And of course, I haven't mentioned, you know, a lot of it. I've mentioned Gates and, you know, Walmart and all these other groups and, and Pearson Publishing. They're all going to make hundreds of billions of dollars off of the charter school system, right? And with the computers and this and that. But the charter school, uh, uh, acceptance of charter schools versus the traditional public school hierarchical with competition K through 12, four years math, science, all this stuff, uh, has, uh, we cannot accept it. Now, I'm not saying that the public school should not be uh, cleaned up, is hardly the word, destroy it and restructure it, right? We can't allow it to be destroyed. And Gerstner, Lou Gerstner, of, uh, former head of IBM, I think, he called on Obama uh, this year. He did it five years ago, too, in the Wall Street Journal. Pulled down all 16,000 public school districts. Now, that is absolutely outrageous. Now, even if you can't stand the public school system, ask yourself why. Because the corporations, they don't want locally elected boards. And the public schools have still have locally elected school boards. And that is a segment of the economy 
Number two, after defense, the biggest. And if we allow that sec segment of the economy to be run by unelected boards, folks, think about it. All the money that you pay for education and you will have no say whatsoever. If, if your child uh, is in a rotten program or comes home and there's been damage or one day, I don't care what, you have no one to go to to complain. Right now, you know, sure, your first grader has got horrible sex set or something. You still have the right to go in there and beat up on the principal or somebody. Maybe they won't listen to you, but you still have that right. So do not let that happen because once it happens, Americans are just going to say, and I, I don't blame them, they're going to say, well, you know, if the second largest uh, spender entity in the country doesn't have elected boards, why do we need elected commissioners? Why do we need elected uh, selectmen? Uh, why do we even need our state legislature? And then we're gone. And that's the message, basically, that our, our project is is very much focused, uh, and with history, like I've given you today a bit, on uh, holding on to the public school system. And now she's going to say, they're going to say, well, how, how, what do you, you mean, really? Huh? Yeah. Well, no. We want to get rid of the Department of Education, but we're going to leave one little office in there. It's still going to be called U.S. Department of Ed. And that will have 50 elected officials from every single state, and they're going to monitor because if you, if you have that little office, you still have congressional oversight. Mm -hmm. They're going to monitor the Department of Ed to make sure it doesn't outsource to Health and Human Services or to Bill Gates or whatever. And we want to, but we, basically everything else to do with the Department of Ed is gone. We, same thing with State Departments of Ed. I know this is a big job, but if we don't do it, it's curtains. State Department that goes down, and then we go back and we elect our superintendent. All of our school board members are elected. Our teachers, no longer teachers' college certification. We're going to make sure they understand their academic, their subjects, that they are good people. You know, they don't have – what on earth it, it, when it happened that we weren't even allowed to look at a personal resume? Now, you know, a corporation does. You know, if somebody's had – a really bad record with sex or something, uh, you, you want to find out because you might have problems with the workforce, but you can't do that now in education. So we'd be very careful who we hire. Go back to the great teachers that we've had in the past, and a lot of them are listening in right now, and know that, uh, that I am, I mean, for me, of all people to be recommending this, that I have to do that. But the option, school choice, Tax-funded school choice is lethal. It's the end of private education because the minute you take a penny, you have to conform everything, hiring, curriculum, testing, et cetera, to federal international guidelines. No, so uh, that, that, that's private education. They want to destroy public education too, see? That's Gerstner. So that goes down. So what they want are these charter schools, which were set up that way in the beginning, the New American School Development Corporation. Vouchers and charter schools are very old. It's nothing new. They have them in Russia. I have an incredible document uh, from the 80s about an English educator working with Americans and all with the Russians on contract schools, working with industry. It's the same thing. The charter schools are going to put in this global workforce training system using Pavlov, and you will have no representation whatsoever. Your child could be shipped here, there, wherever, across borders. That's another thing. Wait until that happens. The tax taxing system. How are you going to keep tra track of your taxes? If, if you t It'll have to go from the local level to the state level because it'll be each child individually being funded with his IEP, to be a, a, a welder or a musician or, or, or a teacher or a lawyer or whatever. This is what we're looking at. And this is the Soviet system. And uh, Professor Boyce out of the University of Georgia explained it very well in a book he wrote. He's the late Professor Boyce about Soviet education. And he, he just said in, in uh, communist countries, they do not educate for jobs that don't exist. So this is the quota system. Once your child's locked in there, 
Uh, he won't be able to get out. He will never be able to do what he wants. And these decisions are being made in fourth, fifth grade. So I asked people, there's an awful lot of information I threw out there at you, but uh, the, the option, the only option, and we want people to get on board. That's where the project is so important, and we call it our toolkit. We want people to take these videos. There are, I mean, about 20 videotaped uh, presentations by leading researchers over the years, teachers included, and explaining what happened. And, and at the end, we, we have a, you know, a, a, a to-do thing, a really good uh, uh, plan to take back America. Believe it or not, uh, it may not work, but at least we'll know we tried. And, uh, and I mean we. There's so many wonderful Americans out there part of this project. And we want everybody to please jump on board, show these Videos you can each one is a can be selected out and downloaded separately. All the written presentations the same. You can take them to your churches, take them to Rotary Club, you know, take them to the Chamber of Commerce, the horrible Chamber of Commerce. Way back, you know, great supporter of the UN. Way back in 1945, we've got their agenda. It's part of the project. We've got their agenda. 1945, they were all for vouchers back then. How so many people think vouchers? That's something new? No. Vouchers and tuition tax credits came from the left. They came from the left, and now, of course, the right isn't right anymore. It's the Trotskyites. Well, that's the left, huh? So, really, it just came from the left, and it stayed with the left. And it's leftist. It is not a true conservative movement. The school choice thing. True conservatism for school choice means you pay. You pay for your child to go to a private school. You can't. You can homeschool, and if you can't do that, you know it, maybe you just don't want to educate them at all. I don't know, but you can't put them in a tax-funded entity because the minute you do, you're going to have to have the same assessment and testing and the same curriculum, and and that's no choice. What kind of choice is that? Okay, Richard, that's enough. Yeah, thus far, it's one of the easiest interviews I've ever had to do. I've got a whole page of notes. I can summarize what you said in maybe 30 seconds. Uh, you're a mother and a teacher, and you spent some time overseas, and you came back to America, and you noticed that there have been drastic changes in American values, behaviors, attitudes, and that's yeah. the very definition of brainwashing. When you looked at the root cause of who was behind all these changes, you found people who reflected internationalist, globalism, a call, call it communism or collectivism, these very different attributes that were being pushed into America and bubbling up through the education system. And witnessing that, you, you took what I consider to be a normal reaction. You tried to investigate as much as you could and then communicate useful knowledge to other people so that they could make informed decisions. Am I on the right track? Oh, yeah, I'm, absolutely. And there's no way, I really don't know that, it may take a certain kind of personality you know, to react the way all of us, not just myself, but a lot of our people have, it hasn't been easy for many of them. So there've been divorces due to moms doing the kind of work I do. Luckily, my husband was Belgian and, and uh, he knew, he was highly educated. He knew a lot more than I knew. He, you know, he, he educated me a lot. I, I hate to say how old I was when I finally got started figuring it out, but uh, once you know, uh, there's, there's no going back. There's just, well, I think traveling a lot has, has a lot to do with it too. And, you know, I'd like to just say something here. I was in Middle Eastern affairs too, in the state department. And so I would go to a lot of the, um, you know, Syrian affairs. That's a sad story, Syria, huh? But, um, I had a very good friend. He was Egyptian. He was the press attache at the, uh, Egyptian embassy. And this was during the Suez Canal problems in Egypt and everything. And he was really nice. His name was Mohammed Habib. And he once, and I don't think I really ever realized how much people around the world appreciated our form of government until every single time I would meet with Mohammed, he would say, Charlotte, 
I just can't get over the magnificence of your Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of your Republic. He would always say, he said, this is so magnificent. He said, every country in the world should have this. And, and I think that's true. And, and that's why it's not just my country. Uh, I want the whole world to benefit from what the United States created, you know, our system and our, I'm not saying they have to have our religion. That's their business. You know, religion is definitely off limits with, I, I have I just don't go for that. And, but our form of government, we're just, it's like offering them the finest crepe Suzette, you know, every morning for breakfast. And, and that's what Mohammed, he knew that. And I think the rest of the world is looking to us now because things are bad out there. I mean, Europe is one horrible mess. I have a lot of family there, Belgian family. And um, so that's what we did. And, and who knows? We, we plead with the American people to get on board what we think is our project, if anybody else comes up with another project that is similar, I'll get on board with them. And we don't have that much time, but we have more time than we think, as I said. They are, we've kept them back. People out there never get media coverage. We don't get any media coverage, right? Sometimes I don't even know whether I exist. I live in Maine. You know, you'd think that I've, I've been pretty... I've been a school board member. I started two organizations here. I'm fighting the conservative governor about school choice and charter schools. And I don't think I exist. I write articles for the main papers about Jeb Bush coming in here and trying to push his horrible school choice agenda, Pearson and computers and all this stuff on Maine and charter schools. And I write an article. I can't get it published. I don't exist. That's why I thank you. You see, you guys are just great. I mean, this what would we do without without this alternative media? I no, think, I mean, I think it's, that a lot of us would be left to uh, take ill information and consider it knowledge when it's nothing more than assumption. And I think exactly that, that you you said you'd join a better project if it came along. Well, at least you're not waiting for the the the, the perfect project to come along. You're saying, what's the best thing I can do now? to progress exactly. in that direction for individual liberty because that's right. very much what they're trying to take away. They're trying to take away, you know, the the essence of what it means to be human. It's very much yes. an attack on the soul through operant conditioning and, and Pavlovian techniques. Yes. And it's also coupled with the psychological techniques of, of learned helplessness and cognitive dissonance. Yes. And what does that do but dissolve your ability for self-confidence and self-esteem and self-reliance? And these are the things we're supposed to get from school. We're supposed right. to get that with an education to I know. learn how to be responsible adults who yeah. can take care of ourselves. And because we can take care of ourselves, we are able to give to others and to help others. Right. But when they take that away and say, uh, you don't need to think, here's a thing called a curriculum. It's input, yeah. curriculum, output. That's mind control. That's brainwashing. You need that's to right. put thinking back in between that stimulus and response. And I think that's what we've all learned. And right. Our various messages may, may word it differently, but that's what we're all trying to say. Everyone that I've interviewed on this show is all about recognizing the value, the, the innate value of being an individual. You have to breathe uh, 40 to 50 times a minute. You have to eat. There are several right. other things that people cannot do for you as a physicality of existence. And thinking is another one of those things. And to right. outsource our thinking is immoral and oh, evil. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's how you started out. You noticed immorality, irrationality, and evil. And you said, as an individual, I'm not helpless. I can do something about you're it. You're right. That's the thing. I think you have to realize that you're not helpless. And I think it's hard. Sometimes you have to get mad, too. That helps because I think some people don't really get mad. And mad is the trigger. And uh, I don't mean you're not going to go out and kill the superintendent or anything. But uh, actually, he lied to me because I got mad, my, super, my superintendent. But uh, I think that you... Uh, there's a, there's a very good good quote on you know the I don't know if you saw the uh, 
trailer yet. Did you look at it? I did see it, and it's a fantastic 27 uh, minutes of what I imagine are many, many hours of very yes. informed speakers laying out, here's the evidence, and it's not an accident. It isn't, and there's that one quote from Thomas Stick that is just, that I mentioned right in the beginning, that is shocking, you know, that it's more important. This is one of the top people at Outcomes Based Ed. It's more important to uh, end discrimination and change values than to teach reading. That is such a, I mean, when I saw that, we've got some bad quotes, but that's a very bad one. And, um, you know, I always think C.S. Lewis's work, too, you know, when, when uh, training beats education, civilization dies. And, uh, and I spoke strongly on, on the soul. You know, this is important. There's no more important war. We've never been in a, in a war more important than this, the destruction of the soul. Horrible. And, uh, you know, Skinner has spoken about it, and, you know, they're quite clear, these, these people, uh, what it can do. But, uh, again, I do want to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to mouth off, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to doing it. And, yes, I, I just I have my, my miniature dachshund that I, I practice with. Very, very smart dog. She's probably on the bed back there that's right lucky, now. That's a lucky dog that gets to see you practice. Oh, yeah. yeah she's just, she's a sweetheart. And, uh, you know, I know that she's a dog. And, and uh, she's a lot smarter than some people I know. But, you know, we're not animals. We should realize that God gave us a brain and, and the ability to think and to challenge and to be artists and musicians. And, and if we don't want to be do anything, just don't do anything. I don't go along with people who say that, you know, we're always going to have people who don't want to do anything. And they're, they're called bums or whatever you want to call. But, but still, they're, they're human beings. And we should be concerned about them, too. And we stop being so judgmental about everybody in our country who's this and that and all. And focus. Focus on what's really important, and that is holding on to our magnificent system, which, which guarantees rights to all of us. Well, I think that was proven in the 1800s with the imagination and creativity in the face of challenges because America led the world in patents. And yes. that type of creativity yep. was then bred out of existence, definitely by the school system. And, yep. you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, time in the future I would like to... Uh, to maybe talk about the influences of the Scottish Rite in connection with the Carnegie groups and go a little bit Don't deeper. But I think this has been a great introductory uh, conversation for people to just to start to put some of these names together. And I'll have some great graphics during the show that will help illustrate this yeah. for the folks at home. Because it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing issue. It has been, uh, there's been several brave people in the past who have waged war through their books and research. Right. It's about getting a critical mass and getting enough people to understand the basics that it's not by accident, that they do have a different agenda. These are people who think very much differently than us. David Rockefeller right. and all of his brothers, uh, you know, as it mentioned, oh. I, I think in your in your trailer uh, for, <laughs> for exposing so the global world to ruin, uh, right. that, that they're dyslexic because of how they were taught to read. And yet you know, these right. characters are influencing how your children at home are learning how to read. So. You know, it's just a, an interesting ongoing problem, and I think it was a fantastic conversation today. I love listening, so it was great to just hear you uninterrupted and, uh, you know, free flow and, and get all these thoughts out on the table. And I'd like to invite yeah. you back for a future episode where we can dig in okay. a little bit deeper. Yeah, no, I, I'd like very much to uh, to do that. Uh, appreciate it. I'm, I hope I didn't. I, I, I think I probably monopolized the conversation. I think the audience enjoys that sort of thing. They're really going to hear you, not me. Well, I don't know. I think you're very interesting, too. And, and uh, sometimes I do get going, and, and I get going. But I guess I'm used to get, getting on like a train. You just mentioned something, that, and I, I probably shouldn't get involved in that now because it would take us on, but we really ought to do something about the Scottish Rite Masons 
I mean, my grandfather was Scottish Rite too, you know, the one, the, the mining engineer, Unitarian, Scottish Rite, Mason, Skull and Bones, everything. But I was fascinated by what we found out. It, it's in the updated version of the Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. It's in the latest one, which is at Amazon. And it's in the last part of the update. And uh, we found the information that the values destroying programs uh, that came in under life, life learning, all this, all these uh, different titles. They they were brought in in the 1940s uh, by a psychiatrist in Delaware who was paid by Carnegie and the Scottish Rite Masons to put this program in. That's dynamite. And, uh, you know, you don't know everything. All I mean, I've been around a long time, and I've been looking for that kind of link, and we found it. And so we know that that's and, – and interestingly enough, the other woman who gave money to this psychiatrist rented our house on Long Island. And when I saw that, you know, that really went – she gave money to the psychiatrist and Carnegie gave money and the Scottish Rite Masons to develop what turned out to be this curriculum, this horrible curriculum, values changing curriculum that oh, I sent you that. Did you get that thing today I sent you? I, did. I sent you an email. I did. I, Have I, you I, ever I seen anything so horrible? I mean, that is, and we think, how have we survived? I don't even know that, how we have any kids around who who aren't all destroyed i think it's just they, hard to breathe the liberty out of americans it's uh yeah it's well i ingrained. think it's a beautiful statement there that you made it has to be because i was looking at it myself and i was thinking i was very involved in that because i used to sit in on the meetings my office joint dissemination review panel and that was the one i remember they were talking about models of teaching and the one guy I was talking about, well, you know, they're not all on board with Skinner yet. But I mean, when you read all the down through, but did you see all the names of the different programs that are under Bruce Joyce's models of teaching? The people finding Common Core should get a hold of that one. I hope that they will contact me in regard to that, because that is going to answer a lot of their questions. The Models of Teaching, Bruce Joyce. Yep. So anyway, you see, you mentioned that, and here I go. <laughs> You're a fountain of useful information, Charlotte, and I would like to thank you ta for taking time out of your busy schedule today and to talk with us. Well, I enjoyed it very much, and uh, I want to wish your listeners well, and uh, it's not all, it's the like old lady, you know, the fat lady hasn't sung yet. And I, I think they're very worried about us, and uh, we've still got time. We do, and I look forward to speaking about these matters uh, in greater detail next time. Good. Thank you very much. All right. You have a great day now. Thank you. Bye-bye. And with all that being said, you can continue to explore Charlotte's body of research and collected evidence and her findings at DeliberateDumbingDown.com, where you can also read her magnum opus, the deliberate dumbing down of America, and much more. You can also make a habit of visiting tragedyandhope.com where you can delve into our myriad media productions and find the links which help you map out how truth is discovered and how to use it for cognitive liberty through informed actions. Tragedy and Hope, recontextualizing history, one episode at a time. Until next time, I'm Richard Grove and I thank you for tuning in and not dropping out.